Hello? Are we on? We're on, yay! Here we go. Okay, I'm going to ask you to turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate as we get ready for our meditation. On this beautiful morning. I'm sorry, my sunglasses on because I have a wounded eye, which I will tell you about in the, in the talk. The adventures of Cedar sinai <laughs> Emergency room. <laughs> so you can take things off your laps, uncross your arms and legs, get comfortable in your seat. Begin by very gently closing your eyes, taking some nice deep breaths. <sighs> Let your shoulders drop. Relax the jaw, the tongue, the eyes, the forehead. All the muscles of the face and head loosen and relax. Let go of time, where you came from, what it took to get here, where you're going later. And just come present into the moment. So if you can hit track 13, we'll hear Bethany. She'll take us on our journey.
nice deep breath. <sighs> Relaxing even more. Letting go now of everything you brought in here with you this morning that no longer serves. Any old limiting thought or belief, a grievance, a worry, a regret, an attachment. What did you come here this morning to let go of? Exhale, so take a nice deep breath and breathe it all out. Releasing it all back into the nothingness as it dissolves and dissipates. Letting yourself float now in a stream of perfect peace and joy and love. floating in the divine presence where there's nothing to get, nothing to fix or change, just this gentle opening to receive. So just look to see how open you are to receive this morning. Not to get, to receive, to allow. The only way we can really receive is if we are non-resistant and relaxed. Let all anxiety fear dissolve as you breathe in light. That light is prana, chi, life itself. It feeds the blood, the bones, the tissues, the organs. It harmonizes the metabolism the immune system, the circulatory system, the nervous system. It regulates the chemical factory of the brain, which now produces all of those pleasure-feeling hormones in perfect balance, reducing pain, inflammation, dissolving any disease or growths, any tension in the muscles, all without us doing anything. We simply allow it to happen. surrender and release it to spirit as we let our consciousness rise above the story of the body letting go of separation and limits into an awareness of oneness, oneness with source, with God, with life, with all that is. The thoughts slow down even more. As you 
simply spend these precious moments now tabernacling with the divine. Begin to breathe in gratitude and appreciation, thanksgiving and praise to the one mind, the one life, for all the good. What are you thankful for this morning? What are the blessings in your world? to mind at least three things that you can be grateful to yourself for, three things that you can honor about you. And we give thanks for our collective good, the chair we sit in, the beings around us, vision, the staff, the volunteers, the freedom that we have to gather like this and believe or not believe whatever we choose, the sacred teachings and teachers that we study, the paved roads that got us here, plentiful food so easily available, fresh water to drink and bathe in, and we now even stretch our consciousness to be grateful for future blessings, that which is still in the invisible, but even now moving into manifestation. As we now move into our intentions. So first, decide how you want to feel when you leave here this morning. And how do you want to feel this week, this holiday Christmas week, Hanukkah, winter solstice, not what you want to have happen. How do you want to feel no matter what happens? And now what are your prayerful intentions? What do you open to receive from this divine presence within? go even deeper to see what is your soul's deepest intention in being here today. And we fold all of these into our group intention, which is as always the healing of our minds, our restoration to joy, to sanity, to inner peace. We recognize that we have been drawn together this morning by the power and in the presence of God. And it is to God that we devote our time spent together, as well as our relationships to one another, knowing that the Holy Spirit within us 
will so guide us in our thoughts and in our feelings and in our perceptions of all things that we may go to sleep tonight as happier, more peaceful, and more loving beings. For this we are thankful, and together we all say, Amen. Welcome, and thank you for coming out on this wonderful holiday weekend. It's great to be here in San Diego. I love San Diego. I don't like coming here. I want to just wake up and be here, not do that. It's like 280-mile round-trip drive, which is why I only come twice a year. Otherwise, I would come and be here more often. But I just burned myself out with that drive doing it for so, so, so many years. Here we are. It's actually, <clears throat> I was thinking about this on the way down, it's something like 31 years since I started this particular journey. So crazy, because it was 31 years ago that I moved to San Diego and uh, started with Terry Cole Whitaker, which, of course, she's really the founder of Vision, basically. This is sort of all passed down from that. <clears throat> and it's so crazy, all that I've been through in those 31 years, and certainly everything that this whole movement has been through in those 31 years. When we started this, many of us who were around then and those of you who were before then, well, we're still a fringe movement, but we were really fringe <laughs> then. I mean, you could not, you know, the books and things, that you had to really get them at your church because you couldn't go to a bookstore and get a lot of these kinds of books and stuff. When Terry was teaching, uh, at the time that I started with her, she was teaching religious science and A Course in Miracles. And A Course in Miracles, you couldn't get that book at a regular bookstore. You would have to order it from the Foundation for Inner Peace or get it from churches and... It was all very weird, and it's still all very weird. <laughs> but way weirder in so many ways. And, and the waters have been extremely muddied under the auspices, the umbrella of spirituality, a word that is truly meaningless. <laughs> it has absolutely become a completely meaningless, useless word, in many ways thanks to its Oprification. <laughs> it's mixed in with all kinds of, of crazy stuff. And so, uh, as I was saying <laughs> before we started about my eye, well, first of all, I think I mentioned this when I was here in the summer. So much of my own personal journey with all of this, and, and really the course talks about this, has to do not so much with learning, but with unlearning. And so I've really amplified my unlearning in the last couple of years, and really a lot in the last year, and then a lot again in, in the last few months. At the very beginning of November, um, I, had, uh, I was in Santa Barbara lecturing, and so, so I know it was the first Saturday in November. That's kind of how I can gauge when things are. And that very day, I felt something weird with my eye, and by the next day or two, it had swollen completely shut. Some of you have seen the picture of it on Facebook. And it just started this horrifying journey because it got infected and I ended up going to Cedar sinai uh, emergency room and it was just a whole lot of crazy foolishness and mayhem. I ended up with patch over my eye, staggering around West Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> it was filled with all kinds of lessons, uh, part of which was how really nice people are. People are so nice, and uh, <laughs> I, it's sort of the height of <laughs> realizing how kind people are when I was, you know, when it was at the worst, and I was all bandaged up, and I was walking from my house to Starbucks, and a homeless woman said to me, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, all right. <laughs> that's how truly pathetic I have become now. Uh, but probably the biggest lesson from that was that I was really, and I'm at home a lot anyhow, I have the life of a house cat, so I don't get out a lot anyhow, but this really trapped me at home a lot. And, uh, and then there, were, there was just like a whole, you know, cosmic conspiracy really to keep me at home. Just pushing all of my buttons. Uh, I live in a huge 
apartment complex with like four different buildings and they decided to do to as a as sort of the pilot program they were going to upgrade and change all the windows and sliding glass doors in my apartment while I was going through all of this and so there and the, you know everything is going to take 20 minutes <laughs> so that was four days of 12 hour days of having to just sit at my computer because there were work people coming in and out of my place all day long there was nowhere to sit but at my computer so I was just sitting there reflecting on my life because one of the things that I did while I was trapped at my computer was I got out all my photo albums and I just scanned all my family photos for like two days and posted them to Facebook and so that gave me a lot of you know reflection on where I've come from and what's you know, what I realized is I just learned a whole bunch of horse shit <laughs> that was mixed in with truth. And that a lot of what we do with this is sifting, 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 sifting. And so after all of this, I started calling myself Ernest Holmes Jr. Because <laughs> it brought me so full circle back around to where I started with Ernest Holmes. And the thing that is so wonderful about Ernest Holmes and that I love is that everything he says is so simple and logical. Even though he was a very intelligent man and studied a lot of different things, but made everything very, very simple. And in fact, I've been reading this uh, big book, The Ernest Holmes Papers. Wait, I have to get my glasses. Now, this was before all of the things that we call spirituality now we're around. I now call myself post-spiritual. <laughs> I'm post-spiritual. <laughs> I'm after all that stuff. <laughs> this is in the section, The Anatomy of Healing Prayer. Some of you probably who are my age and older know of Adela Rogers St. John, who was a friend of Ernest Holmes. Adela Rogers had dinner with me the other night, and she was speaking about spirituality. And I said, wait a minute, Adela, I don't know what you mean. She was all worked up over it, getting spiritual. And I told her, I don't know whether I'm spiritual or not. I feel like I'm very close to the earth. I love the things of the earth, but I can get along without them. Well, she said, spirituality is that which is not materialistic or material. And I said, there isn't any matter, Adela. Matter's been dissolved in the minds of thinkers for ages, and it hasn't even a peg to hang its hat on in modern physics. There is no material universe. Therefore, we don't have to contend with one. Where is a spiritual universe? Where you are looking, period. That's the end of the sentence and of all the lesson. Isn't it interesting? Don't try to be good. You don't know what good is, and I certainly don't. They didn't think Jesus was very good. Just be yourself. Now, how simple is that? <laughs> Somebody was telling me recently about wanting to be enlightened. I said, and what is that? Nobody knows what the hell that is. <laughs> it's some other thing that sells scarves and incense. <laughs> right? And it seems like the whole spirituality movement is about trying not to be a person anymore. which is completely insane. It's like going to Disneyland and trying not to have the Disney experience. <laughs> we come to Earth to have a human experience. And then we come to spirituality and try to get rid of it. I'm spiritual now. What does that mean? Nothing. Everybody's spiritual. There is only a spiritual universe. When he's saying there's no such thing as a material universe and talking about physics, well, that's because matter is 99.9999 empty space. Right? There's really no such thing as mind over matter. The early metaphysicians said mind and matter are one. They are the same thing. And so trying to divorce ourselves from the human experience to have some highfalutin spiritual experience, when really what that comes down to more or less is, I'd just like to be a more loving person and have more peace of mind. That's basically what it is. 
when we think about what spiritual is, and then we work, 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 work so hard to get there. I'm trying so hard to be who I am. <laughs> what is more effortless than being who you are? So what I love about Ernest, he just makes it all very, very simple. And so I've taken to just reading a lot of it. And really, just I've thrown out so much old stuff. And I've brought back so many things that I threw out along the way. I've brought back all of my forbidden words. <laughs> I had lots and lots of forbidden words. I brought them all back, planning and strategizing and goals and all that. I brought all those back. The only word that really I still... Uh, and a word that certainly has no place in new thought is hope. Hope. Hope is just the worst thing in the world. <laughs> hope and wishes. Oh my God, and sometimes they get mixed in with new thought too, especially when, you're, when you get that magical thing going. People with magical thinking get going, hoping and wishing. In fact, my favorite musical is Into the Woods, which is opening on Christmas Day, the movie of it. And so that movie should teach you everything you need to know about why wishes are horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and what wishing really is, if you really look at what wishes are, wish is you wish somebody would do something. It's the exact opposite of everything New Thought is about, which is I am responsible and I am the creator. So wishes are always I wish somebody would save me or fix me. No one is ever coming to save you. <laughs> Be glad. <laughs> Whoever saves you now has all the power. Whoever saves you has all the power. You know, if you look at the story, that, I mean, it's interesting because all of those stories were people who just played victim. Oh, I wish I could go to the ball. Oh, I wish the prince would come and save me. Well, of course, that show Into the Woods is, the first half is, is sort of that wish fulfillment, but then the whole second half is what happens after Happily Ever After and the nightmare it is when you've <laughs> given your power to someone who has saved you. And so... If you look at something like, I was thinking about The Wizard of Oz because it's such a powerful story. We all know that. And if you really look at it, hardly anyone helped Dorothy at all. <laughs> Everyone was not only useless, they mostly made things worse. And it is a wonderful story because it's the story of this victimy girl who goes from powerlessness to power. And of course, the lesson we all know is that there is no power outside of you. The power was in you the whole time. Even the good witch, seriously, all she did was give her directions. She didn't even give her a ride. She had a pink bubble. She didn't even offer. She said, I can't help you. You're really screwed. There's a guy, though. He lives way over there. It's a treacherous journey. Hope you make it. Catch up with you later if you're around. Took off in her pink bubble. Toto was more help than anybody. Everybody else just slowed her down, really. She had companions, it was nice, but basically she had to kill the witch herself. She had to do everything herself. So when, you, that's why like Ianla Van Zant, who, when she was on early days of the Oprah show back in the 90s, one of the things that she was sort of famous for, because mostly she would talk to an audience of women about men. And so a lot of what she was doing was coaching women how to take back their own power. And the thing that she would do, she was, she was uh, raised in Pentecostal churches. And so she'll, she says, sometimes I will you know, get that preacher thing going. So what she would do during those Oprah shows is she would have the women say, save yourself, save yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, as you get, oh, no, it's for me to save myself, right? That's the essence of that power, and Dorothy saved herself. And a lot of what I've been talking about lately is 
uh, has to do with this human experience and how, and particularly how, what the great way that Ernest Holmes had of making it all even. There weren't spiritual issues and then money issues and then health issues and then it was really all one thing. What I've been telling people lately is, particularly in Ernest Holmes days and Napoleon Hill and all of those people talked a lot more about sex than we do now. Because that's part, see spiritual people are horny. Have you noticed that? <laughs> There's a lot of horniness that goes on among spiritual people. And that's a natural thing, really. And Ernest Holmes talked about in this in the Science of Mind text a little bit in the in the initial one and in other writings of his, because Basically, what we're doing is we're having sex with the universe. That's what the creative impulse is, is that we come here and we want to create. That's God evolving as us. That's how God evolves, as us. Whatever your desire is, if it doesn't hurt anybody or take anything from anybody else, that is God wanting to create. That's why Ernest Holmes would always say, God writes every song, God writes every book, God reads every book, God does every dance. That's the creative impulse. That's why we want to create. It's unnatural to not want. It's unnatural to not desire. It's unnatural to not have goals. And sometimes people get into this thing of, well, I want spiritual goals. I want peace of mind. And I want, you already have that. How can you, you already have that. You're not going to get any more peace than you have right now. You're just not activating it if you don't feel it. But you're not going to get any more peace. It's already there. Jesus said, my peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Now, activate it. The way you activate it is to focus on it instead of focusing on worrying and scarcity and fear and all the things that we see in the news all the time and isn't it awful? What are we going to do now? So I started undoing all the complicated things that I'd learned to just make it very, very simple. It's so wonderful when it's simple, isn't it? It's so wonderful when it's simple. We, you know, I love A Course in Miracles, but to me now a lot of it is just bullshit of Helen's. She hated the world and kind of hated people, so of course it would come out in the book that the world is a horrible place created by the ego as an attack on God. What bullshit. That's ridiculous. The world was created by love as an expression of love, and we love to be here when we're in our right minds. Not in an attached way, just like Ernest Holmes said, I like the things of the world, but I can live without them. If I don't have to have them, I'm not attached to them. But then all the other stuff in the course where you could tell where she was in her right mind about love and forgiveness and oneness and peace. That's why, you know, like that word spirituality doesn't mean anything. It's like a word Christian. That doesn't mean anything because there's all different kinds of Christians. Most Christians aren't really Christians. They're Paulists because they're really not following the teachings of Jesus at all. They're following the teachings of Paul. And Paul was not Jesus. Paul was like you and me. Sometimes he was in the mood, and sometimes he'd had it with you. <laughs> so sometimes there was a lot of love and truth, and you could tell it was really pure, and then other times it was like, that's it, no women speaking in church. <laughs> right, because some woman pissed him off, so that's it. Right, he would just make up rules because I don't like that, and then he would fire off, because all of that is, are the letters of Paul, right? So... Just think about you if they created a religion out of your emails. <laughs> think about that. What that would read like. <laughs> so they made, they made a religion out of the letters of Paul that he fired off sometimes when he was feeling good, sometimes when he was pissed. Right? So those things become meaningless. And so in many ways, to me, that's what The Course in Miracles is. You can tell when Helen was in her right mind and it's about love and peace and joy, and then you can tell when she was off, right? So I just don't read that part anymore. I've resolved all that language to ego. There's no such thing. Even The Course says there's no such thing, so why do you keep talking about it? <laughs> it's like introducing an enemy 
Let's stop introducing an enemy to fight. Let's just go in the direction that feels good, right? How much easier that is to just decide. And that's what is wonderful at this time of year. I, um, if you go to jacobglass.com, then there's a link that says resources. And if you just scroll down, you'll see it will say New Year's Journal. And this is a PDF that you can just download. It's free. And then you can print it out. I've been doing this for years. And it's sort of based a little bit on um, the Mastermind Journal that was started by Jack Boland from the Unity Church, which was based on Think and Grow Rich. So what it does is the first half of it, you print it all out. It's double-sided. Fold it together. This half is 2014, this half is 2015. So the first half is acknowledging the old year, what you're grateful for, what you learned, what you're letting go of, things like that. And then the next half is your goals and your intentions, what you want to create and what you want to give and all that stuff. And it's very exciting, it's very fun, it's very wonderful. Because it's fun to decide what you want and go for it. Now, this is my only disclaimer now. I used to have a lot of disclaimers. This is my only disclaimer now is having your dreams come true will not make you happy. Happiness is a decision that we make. So having your dreams come true and reaching your goals will not make you happy or unhappy. It is only our thinking which makes us happy or unhappy. And so that's the only problem, really, that we have with goals and plans and intentions, is that we get, when we get attached to them, we make them God. They become the source of our happiness now. So I now talk about having goals and agenda and all that kind of stuff, but in pencil. <laughs> it's all in pencil because it's all going to change as you go. The only upsetting thing is when you base your self-worth on whether you achieve a goal or not. The purpose is to enjoy the journey, because the destination doesn't last that long anyhow. Once you're there, then you're just there. Then you're going to think, what's over there? <laughs> right? That's what you want. You want to keep being interested in life. Not to acquire, not to get, but to be participating in the great cosmic drama. Not the cheap soap opera. <laughs> the divine cosmic drama. And what that comes from is following those divine urges. I heard recently, um, Actually, I heard Barbara Walters and Oprah both talking about this based on a conversation they had with each other about their journey, where they both said, we didn't really enjoy the journey very much. And uh, I heard Oprah say why. She said later, because she was actually saying it to, um, was it Jimmy Fallon? Yes, it was Jimmy Fallon, because he just started his journey of hosting The Tonight Show. And so she was saying to him, you have to make sure that you take breaks in between to savor what's happening. She said, because the reason I didn't enjoy the journey was because when you're in it, you, there's so much going on that you are just thinking about what's next. So this is hardly even over till you're on to the next thing. So she said, I don't do that anymore. Now I choose what I'm going to do, and then there's in-between time so that during that I can rest in savoring the, not just the journey, but oh, this is now this is what it's like to be here. Let me rest in this. Let me have the experience of this. And that's really the way it's supposed to be. I remember when we, uh, in my groups here, we talked for a while about that book, The Power of Full Engagement. And that was really about that. Which it said the, the lie that we tell is that life is a marathon. And it says, you will not last in a marathon that lasts a lifetime. <laughs> that you need to think of it as a series of sprints. So you're sprinting, and then you stop, and you recover. And it talked about, because these guys worked with elite athletes a lot, and they talked about that, that they had seasons, like sports have seasons, and then you have an off season. And so it was all about that you, there are seasons where you're creating, and this is, I mean, this is biblical even, right? There's a season and a time for everything. So there's a time for sowing, and there's a time for reaping. 
And really right now, this is winter solstice eve. So this is the time when, at least metaphorically, when because the days are so much shorter, it's a time of going within. There's less outer activity. We don't have that quite as much here in California, but there are other places where it's just difficult. You're snowed in, you're frozen in, so you're forced really to slow down in your life. We're supposed to do that here too. We don't have to physically because of the weather, so then it's more behooves us to build it into our life all the time. Of okay, and really, it's not even about, it's about areas of life, right? So that you might be very active in an area of your life while you're letting another part of your life rest, right? It's hard to run on all cylinders all the time. So you might be working on career and you're not working on family right now. So you're single and you're just focused on your career and so on and so forth. So there are seasons of life. So it's about really being present for all the seasons and making the most of it. I would say new thought to me is about getting more out of life. It's in there. This is one of the things that Ernest Holmes would talk about. He'd say, we act like we're putting something into the principle. We're not. We're taking it out. We don't have to make something happen mentally. We're taking it out. It's already in there. We're withdrawing it, right? We're getting more out of life. That's why the most significant spiritual practice that you can have is gratitude. Gratitude and appreciate, that's the most, that just covers just about everything, really. Just about everything. There's very few things that affect most of us, certainly in this room, where we can't say it could have been worse. So even that, there's somewhere where you can be grateful that whatever. Even when I was sitting there in Cedar sinai emergency room and everyone was running around trying not to get Ebola. <laughs> they were all obsessed with that. Everybody had masks on. They were all, I'd gone from the doctors to the emergency room to the surgeons to this to that, and they keep taking your blood pressure, and of course it goes up every time. And then they're like, is your blood pressure normally high? No, but I've been in the emergency room. Blah, blah, blah. So, <laughs> not getting more peaceful as the day goes on. Okay. <laughs> But during that whole experience, I was talking to myself the whole time with all of these things that we know. I was taking my emotional journey because I didn't really have control over the external journey. Right? So I was telling myself, oh, every hand that touches me is a healing hand. The only thing that's really true is man sitting in chair. Like I was doing all of this stuff to keep calming myself down and being present in the moment. And so that really is where all of our happiness comes from, is what's going on in our mind at any given moment. Not what's happening, but what's going on in my mind while this is happening. And I started telling people lately, when you realize that, okay, happiness is just a decision that I make, no matter what's happening, now that I've practiced this and it'll be a lifetime of practice, now I might as well just go for everything else. Now I don't go for my goals because they'll make me happy. I go for my goals because why wouldn't I? Who comes to earth and says, I'm going to resist going for it? <laughs> I'm going to try with all my might to resist the urge to ever do anything. Right? But I used to think that a lot. I, 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 I used to lie to myself a lot. I don't know if you've ever done that. But this was the big thing that really, this was my huge revelation that came to me while I was stuck at home and I was thinking about all these things that I had told these stories for so long and then I realized, well, those stories are not true. I mean, I had taught them in lectures for years and years and years and years and years, which I would like to apologize for now, by the way. <laughs> but I told them for years before I realized, well, that's not the truth. That's not how that happened. I mean, that's just the thumbnail sketch of how that happened. And it wasn't like I was deliberately leaving things out. I wasn't thinking clearly because I was trying to place the situation in a belief system I already had. Have you ever done that? So what I realized was that I'd told all these stories about how uh, Things had just unfolded for me, and doors had just opened, and I had just walked through. And then when I looked back at it, I was like, well, I did all that. 
I planned all of that. I strategized all that. I did all of that. And yes, there were doors that opened unexpectedly in little places, but they were all due to my effort. They really were all do. I mean, I <laughs> I, don't, I shouldn't tell. Them. Now this will be on YouTube even. I just love to tell shit that I'm not supposed to say, <laughs> or shouldn't be, but whatever. <coughs> when I started filling in for Marianne Williamson about four years ago or so in Los Angeles, that didn't just happen. That was not just some random thing that happened. She and I normally spoke at the Miracle Distribution Center conference during the summer most years. Not every year, but most years. And they always have it the same weekend. And it was always the weekend that my Saturday lecture in Santa Barbara was, so I could only speak on the Sunday. And they usually wanted Marianne to speak on the Sunday to close the conference. So they would want us to speak on different days because we were sort of people that people were interested in seeing a lot. So they wanted to break it up. So. I had said, well, I can't speak on Saturday, and so um, I guess, you know, I'm not going to speak at all because they didn't want, so anyhow, that was that year. Well, then I got a call from them, and they said, Marianne has canceled on Sunday, and so could you fill in for her? So I said, yes, I can fill in on Sunday. That's great. And then I kept looking and seeing that they kept her picture in all the flyers and on the website that she was going to be there. And so I was like, well, there's some mistake, and then I saw that it was still on her website that she was going to speak there. And so I just figured, well, obviously her plans have changed and she's going to do it. And I also knew, and this was like in May, and the conference is like in August, and I saw on her website that she was leaving for like three weeks at the end of June and the beginning of July. And so I knew from experience that if I just called and said, can I fill in for you, that I, she wouldn't. It had to be her idea. <laughs> so instead, what I did was I sent her an email saying, I'm supposed to fill in for you at the Miracle Distribution Center conference, aren't I? Because that's what they called. And they said, you know, that I was filling in for you. <laughs> so I knew that would put that in her head. So she sent me back an email that said, oh, no, I'm doing that. But I'm going away in June. Maybe you could fill in for me. Now, that was strategic. <laughs> that was something I planned and thought about and was strategic. <laughs> and I've done things like that all along. When I started lecturing in Santa Barbara, I worked at it a lot. I publicized it. I put ads in papers. I had a public access show that was on for 10 weeks. A lot of that before I had even started lecturing. I had flyers all over the Earthling bookstore there that was the big bookstore in town. So I'd put a lot of effort into things. And what I realized was, and this was something that I got from Stuart Wilde, if you're familiar with Stuart Wilde, who writes a lot of crazy, fabulous uh, New Thought books. He's passed away now, but uh, he was a Hay House author. Is there is a difference between effort and struggle. And that's the line you don't want to cross that we don't need to struggle. So when we talk in New Thought about effortless accomplishment, that's not really what we're going for. Because everything takes some effort, right? You didn't just appear here this morning, right? Like you had to drive here, or get someone to drive you here, or dress, or buy a ticket, or like there's effort involved in everything. But effortless accomplishment sounds better than struggleless accomplishment. But that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about struggleless accomplishment. Because once you get into struggle, what that means is now you're attached to the result. When you're efforting, you're not attached to the outcome. You want the outcome, but you're living in that Ernest Holmes place of, but I don't need it to happen. I want the experience, but I am not attached to it. I'm going for it, but if it doesn't happen, it doesn't mean I'm a failure. It may mean I failed. It's okay to fail. It's great to fail. If you're not failing, it means you're not doing shit. <laughs> failing is part of the process. John Maxwell has a book called Failing Forward. You know, I was writing something about... Uh, 
my mother being a good businesswoman, and someone was said, well, but her business closed. I'm like, well, that doesn't mean anything. Lots of people who are good business people have their business closed. That has nothing to do <laughs> with... There's lots of people who are horrible business people, and their business goes on and on and on. And you wonder, how do they stay open? Sometimes it's like location, location, location. They just are in the right place, right? So failing is part of the process. And the fear of failure, the fear of disappointment, so much of what I've talked about the last, do you ever see that book, Wake Up and Live? Oh, it's a great book. And that book, I don't know, is probably from like the 1940s or something like that, or 50s, maybe the 40s. And then like 20 years later, there was a book by um, John Randolph Price, I think, called The Power of Decision. And I ended up getting these books just sort of randomly at the same time. And they both had this phrase in it that I'd never seen before, which was the will to fail. There is a will to fail within us. But what that means is, what they both mean in that book is very interesting because it doesn't mean what you might think it means where you go in and deliberately or even unconsciously sabotage a situation. The will to fail is when you talk yourself out of even trying. Now, I want you to think about that, not in terms of the big things in your life, although certainly that, but I want you to start to, in the next days and weeks as you go through, to see how you do it all day long. Talk yourself out of even trying something. Even, look, parking. <laughs> no. Right? You want to go over and talk to that person, you go, oh, they're busy now. I'll wait until everyone else dies. <laughs> right? Whatever. All the ways, just all day long. That's the will to fail. It's the, I don't want to actually fail, so I will fail by not even trying because then I won't be embarrassed, I won't be hurt, I won't be disappointed, I won't be any of these things. I will instead just fail by not even showing up for the experience. So a lot of what I've been talking about lately has been, and my eye was the perfect example of this, is the resistance that comes up within us. That what is really necessary for us to live fully is to develop courage to walk through our resistance and fear. That's what life is then. It's the courage to walk through our resistance and fear. As I started opening up to the idea of, okay, I want to do this, and I want to experience this, and I want to do this, and I want to do this, it was no mistake then that my eye would swell up like that. That's what they used to call in the old days chemicalization. Right? Some of you people who studied people like Emil, Emily Cady and people like that talk about chemicalization. Chemicalization is not... It's, it can be physical, but it is when a new thought is introduced into your mind, a desire, a, a whatever it is, when it meets up with a wall of resistance or some old thought which opposes it, it creates a chemical reaction. You know, it's like Alka-Seltzer. This chemical reaction happens. And so in a lot of ways, it's like... Uh, it's the unconscious mind's way to try and stop you, to keep you safe, right? Go back, right? <laughs> right? It's like the great and powerful Oz, go back, right? Which is actually nothing. It's an illusion. See, the thing is, is that the way that fear dissolves is by walking through it. Every step forward dissolves another layer of fear and resistance. But we tend to think, I'll wait until I'm not afraid. It will never happen. That's like saying, once I get more confidence, I will ask for a raise. No, asking for the raise is what gives you confidence. You understand? So chemicalization can be physical. It can be like, 
Like you could say, I want to have more abundance in my life. And then for the first time in 10 years, six checks bounce. So you go, wait a second. <laughs> right? That's chemicalization. That's that, OK, I have this old belief about being worthy of abundance, or wanting abundance isn't spiritual, or, or people who have money are horrible, awful, greedy people. So then when you decide to work on abundance, that old thought system will just rise up. But it just rises up. But if you just keep walking, you're OK. Right? So it wasn't a mistake to me that my eye would swell up like that, because as Abraham says, <laughs> you take your body with you almost everywhere you go. So when something happens to your body, a lot of times that's better because you can't get away from it. If, if your checks are bouncing, well, you can just go to the movies and forget about it. <laughs> right? If something is happening out there, or if it's somewhere under your sweater even, <laughs> you're OK. But if it's your eye, <laughs> everybody's looking right at this gaping wound where homeless people are saying, are you OK? <laughs> Right? Oh, don't worry about me. I just have some resistance. <laughs> right? Particularly because one of the first things that came up was, OK, I want to start dating again. And so immediately, you know, I look like something out of a horror show. <laughs> so like. Now, I live, I don't just live in Los Angeles, I live in West Hollywood. So they're dropping off new Abercrombie and Fitch models every 20 minutes there, okay? <laughs> so, so I'm surrounded by gorgeous people, and as you probably know, they're making people more attractive every year. Every generation of people is more attractive than the one before. And so I'm thinking, I'm going out, and I have this wonky eye. Now, by this time, it was just not as bad, but it was bad to me, anyhow. And I thought, well, I'm going to go anyhow. Because this is what the mind always does, is I'm going to wait for a better time. But this is what the courage to walk through the resistance is, is the willingness to actually put effort into it when you don't feel like it. I remember Terry saying years ago, now this is not about the feelings of your intuition and guidance. This is about your moods. So when I'm saying feelings right now, I mean your moods, OK? So Terry would say, listen. You can't live your life according to your feelings, because if you live according to your feelings, you will never be everything you were meant to be, because most of the time you won't feel like it. I don't feel like it. You could go out tonight, happy hour, and flirt. I don't feel like it. OK? So now, OK, so <laughs> I have so many things to say and not nearly enough time to say them all today. I'm trying to teach you everything I learned in three months. One of the things that the horror of things like The Secret, The Secret, The Secret, uh, <laughs> brought out, because there are aspects of that that, of course, are true. We understand that it's true. But here's the problem with that. You cannot vision your way out of problems you keep behaving your way into. So to just wish something in, or vision something in, or dream something in, does not mean that you are in a position to handle it when it comes. Now, for instance. This is the thing. This is the other aspect of wanting to be saved. Everybody wants someone to discover them. You're going to be discovered somehow, and someone's going to produce you, right? Somebody's going to, I'm going to start my own business just as soon as someone gives me all the money. Okay, why would they? 
Why would they? Why would they give the money to you? Of all the people that they could give it to, why would they give it to you? Why would someone want to date you? Of all the people in the world, why would anyone want to date you? Why would anyone want to come to your business? Why would anyone want to help you? Why would they? If you don't have a really good reason why, then you are in trouble. Because you're the one that has to know why. You have to know what you're bringing to the table, and you better be bringing something pretty great. That's our job. Is what, see, this is the problem with this wishing and hoping is, is we're just thinking about what we're getting, not what we're bringing to the table. What are you bringing to the table? Why would someone give you the money for your business? You know, I watched this documentary. It was a documentary about male strippers. <laughs> it was a documentary. Therefore, it's educational. Uh, it was actually by Joe Manganiello, uh, who was in Magic Mike. So he did a documentary of these male strippers at like the most successful male strip club in the country, which is in Texas. And so it was, and it's really like it's done really well, and the idea was that they wanted people who were very professional and took it seriously and were not drinking it on drugs and trying to screw the women and all this kind of stuff, where it was really like people who took it seriously. And one of the guys impressed me so much because he wants to open his own restaurant. And so he's putting little money aside, you know, from his stripping money because that's his dream. But what he said that was fascinating to me was he has the guys and people come over almost every weekend for a barbecue where he makes these gourmet hamburgers that he wants to serve at his restaurant. And he said, I am always writing new business plans all the time of all the business plans because he says, you know, I meet a lot of people. There are a lot of wealthy people who come in here. People, I don't know who my contacts are going to be, but he knows what he's bringing to the table. Not just, oh, I have an idea, someone should finance it. It's, why should they finance your idea? If you don't know, you better start working on yourself. Right? When I go out and I have a wonky eye and I'm a 54-year-old gay dude surrounded by Abercrombie models, I'm like, you know what? You cannot be coy or shy. <laughs> You're going to have to be way more friendly Charming, complimentary, engaging, assertive than anybody else here. <laughs> right? You cannot just go and draw them in with the magnetic energy you are radiating, right? <laughs> Someone will see that I am a diamond in the rough. <laughs> right? No, they won't. Like, you have to know what you're bringing. You don't have to be perfect, but you better know what you're bringing to the table. That's why I always say, you don't live the life you deserve, you live the life you think you deserve. Because if you know who you are, then you're not even wasting time wishing and hoping. You know. You, that's why I said, I love the Ernest Holmes. It's so logical. It's like, you put a seed in the ground, and something starts to happen. But you don't just put a seed in the ground and then walk away. You've got to do weeding. You've got to do watering. You've got to make sure the bugs aren't eating at it. You've got to, you, there's still work to be done, but it's a participatory work. You don't make it grow, but you still are participating. And that's the thing, is to stay engaged without being attached. That's the line. Being engaged without being attached. To be able to say, these are my goals and objectives. This is what I would like to experience. I'm not going to be miserable if it doesn't happen. But what's the point in hanging out if I'm not going to go for it? I was, you know the people that inspire me are older people. There's a woman that I know who is 80 years old who just had her first art show. She just wrote her first book and filmed her first documentary. What did Jacob do this year? <laughs> right? That's the inspiration. Is There's someone who's 80 who's not saying, well, it's winding down here. Oh, and she has cancer too, by the way. She has cancer. That, uh, it might be her second round of cancer, but basically she was supposed to die like years ago. And you know those people, they're supposed to die. 
you know? And so, but whatever, because of medicine and the way things are now, whatever it is, they're able to just basically sort of keep it in check. So she still has it, but she's still living and going and all of that stuff. Uh, you know, pictures of her on Facebook with her husband in Paris and walking on the beach. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to go to the movies because it's going to be crowded. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> I love the phrase little by little. That's one of the other things that is an issue, I think, sometimes in new thought, is we always want a quantum leap. We want it to happen all at once. We want the illness to be healed instantly. One of the things about my eye that was so great is that it's such a long healing process. I mean, finally, the eye doctor said to me, I think he just didn't want to see me anymore, actually. And he just said, you know, you don't have to keep coming back. It's just going to take a long time. long time to heal. <laughs> and now I think of it as a mood eye. Did you ever see those mood rings? Because like some days it's worse and some days it's better and some days it's great in the morning and in the afternoon it's bad again. I just go and I just look and go, that's where you are now. That's where you are. <laughs> because that's, you know, this is that, again, so much of this is about resistance. Relaxing resistance, like wanting, ugh, I don't want to face this, I don't want to, you know, it's, there's a huge difference. This is another thing I discovered. There's a huge difference between saying, I've given that to spirit to handle. In other words, I've done all that I can do, and I've surrendered it to spirit to let it unfold in perfect divine order now. That's completely different than what we actually sometimes do but we pretend we've done this. But what we're really doing is, I don't want to deal with that right now. I don't want to deal with that right now is different than I've given that to spirit to handle. I don't want to deal with that right now means, don't worry, I'll be back and you won't like it. <laughs> if you had dealt with me right now, wouldn't have been a big deal. But now I'm going to go get some friends <laughs> and we'll be back. Right? <laughs> so it's all those things that we resist that we resist instead of just looking at and dealing with it like part of this thing with my eye was to just say it's going to take as long as it takes it will heal little by little what's going to make it awful is resisting it and wishing it were different that's why the, I mean the wisdom of the serenity prayer is unbelievable it is absolutely unbelievable that prayer is so powerful to just recognize some things I can change, I should change those. Some things I can't change, I should accept those. Duh. <laughs> Maybe I'll take 800 workshops instead, read a thousand books, go on 15 retreats. But again, it's so, it's so simple when we let it be simple. But this is one of, the, one of the things I've been telling people so much this year is we talk about, it's so hard, it's so hard, it's so hard, it's so hard, it's so hard. And I say, a lot of things are not that hard, but we make it hard. By our resistance and the story we tell and everything we do around in this time of year, I mean, talk about mythology. I'm not talking about the religious mythology. First of all, really, this is the celebration of the winter solstice. We just threw Jesus in there. <laughs> right? Because, really, I mean, as far as the historians know, he was born in the spring sometime. But the early church, one, they knew the pagans are the ones who have good parties. <laughs> we should move in with the pagans. Let's just uh, usurp their holiday. So that's why it's such a mishmash of crazy crap. Because you've got Jesus, and then you got a tree, 
right? I mean, that's a pagan, that's the pagan symbol of the winter solstice is the tree, okay? But we'll just throw that in there. And then there's some guy who brings presents. That's a whole other thing in another part of the world. We'll bring that in. And then, so you just bring in all, just whatever, just throw it all in and see what they like. In fact, in fact um, my friend Zan, those of you who've known me for a while now, I talk about Zan. She's like my sister, and she's Italian. And um, so one year when, we were, when I was living in Santa Barbara and she came up and stayed overnight, this was in early January, and we got up in the morning, and I'd never even heard of this before, but we got up in the morning and she said, thanks for ruining La Bafana for me. <laughs> I mean, she was kidding, because La Bafana, you take your shoes and put them outside the door before you go to bed at night because there's a witch named La Bafana who comes and leaves candy. <laughs> so like this is like all this stuff that has to do with this many days after Christmas and blah, 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 and all this stuff. So there's just all this crap that goes on. So that's just all the religious hoopla that we've just thrown in just what the hell. We'll hit you somewhere. Um, but then you add all of what Hallmark has done with it. <laughs> and then what you have is a formula for suffering. When in fact, you know, because you get into all the things of like, well, it's not Christmas without grandma. <laughs> or, well, it's not Christmas if we don't have, you know, the fruit salad. <laughs> or it's not whatever. So you start making up stories to pre-suffer. I just want everyone to be happy. Well, not, there's no frickin' way everyone's gonna be happy. And you know what you see? This is what you see on reality shows a lot, which is what makes them dramatic and horrifying, is there's always somebody saying, and it's because they're mostly women-based, there's almost always some woman saying, I just want it to be perfect. <laughs> this is the prelude to every horrifying thing that will happen after that, because nothing is the mind's idea of what perfect is is. So I just want everyone to be happy. Well, forget it. The only person's happiness that you can control at all is your own. Anything beyond that is really out of your control. Right? So we get make up all these stories then about what the holiday is supposed to be and where you're supposed to go and who's supposed to be there and what's a bad holiday is if you do this, you know. Let me tell you my Christmas Eve story. It starts here in San Diego in the 1980s at a disco. <laughs> That's how long ago this was. This was like 1983 at a place at the time was West Coast Production Company. So it was a gay bar over on the other side of the treks. <laughs> so I ended up spending Christmas Eve there and thinking this is horrible. This is not what Christmas Eve is supposed to be. Here I am single and alone with a lot of other drunk people and it's awful and I hate it and I hate my life and I am going to fix this. And that began my journey to find sacred, holy Christmas Eve the way it was in my mind what Christmas Eve should be. We'll cut to the early, well, 1990. I am living in Santa Barbara. I have a small group that I'm lecturing to of about 12 people at this time. I've just started lecturing on the course. I go with a friend to the Arlington Theater, which is the biggest theater in Santa Barbara. It's this beautiful, historic theater that seats like 1,700 people. I say to my friend, I want to do a Christmas Eve service here. Three years later, sure enough, we're doing a huge Christmas Eve service with Marianne Williamson and on and it's everything that I dreamed that it would be. It's me and Marianne on stage and we have a choir and there's a big organ that comes up from under the stage and there's a man playing it and there's the whole ceiling is lit like stars and there's all these people. And it was so awful. <laughs> because all I did was work and ruin my Christmas trying to put on this event, which I then put on every year for five or six or seven or eight years in one degree or another into ever smaller venues to keep making it simpler and simpler and simpler and simpler. And what I realized was that I had gotten to the place in my life where I was never lonely at all except at those freaking Christmas Eve services. <laughs> The only night out of the year I ever experienced any loneliness at all was doing a Christmas Eve service 
this year I plan to be at a gay bar. <laughs> it's right around the corner. In fact, there's 10 right around the corner. <laughs> but it's that, I had that notion of what the holiday is supposed to be and it's supposed to mean and it's supposed to be like this and this is what it is. And what I realized about all holidays is it's just another day. Christmas is just Thursday with people off work. That's it. Everything else about it is something you bring to it. So don't bring stuff to it that makes you miserable. Bring stuff to it that makes you happy. I have a tree. I watch Christmas movies. I have poinsettias. I have decorations everywhere. I have lights. I have all that stuff. I don't buy one single present. I have presents under the tree. They're empty boxes <laughs> that are stored in my closet. There's nothing in them. It's surrounded. I don't buy a single card. I don't go to a party. I don't go to a dinner because I don't want to. But I love my holiday because I do it the way that feels good to me. I've let go of all the, well, it, you should spend Christmas with somebody. I did that for years. I can't tell you how much worse it is to go watch people fight with their families. <laughs> you don't even want to fight with your family, right? So, but if you have somewhere to go that makes you feel happy, then that's the thing to do, but to make ourselves suffer over what should be happening at this time of year. What, wouldn't it be great if, wouldn't it be great if, wouldn't it be great if? Well, you know, so much of our emotional journey is about, are you gonna make the best of things or are you gonna make the worst of things? That's the question. Are you gonna make the best of things or make the worst of things? And if you don't like the way things are, then you begin to look at what can I change that won't mean me manipulating and controlling the universe? Like making everybody else get on board with something they don't wanna do or whatever. What can I do that will start to move me in the direction of where I wanna be doing, being and having and experiencing, right? One of the things that I decided was I wanted to start lecturing in Los Angeles. And so I went out uh, and rented a tiny little space in Los Angeles to start, right? You start little by little. I really believe now, for a long time I, I made fun of people who talked about dreaming big, and I still am making fun of the concept of what that means to people. I absolutely believe in dreaming big, but what's big is the energy. We live in a world that thinks that dreaming big means the form. And that's where so many people go wrong. Because I live in, in right, I live just a block off Santa Monica Boulevard. And so a lot of that whole block are businesses that are open for six months, just long as their lease lasts. Because what people do now, this is so amazing. I, I'm just sort of blown away by this. Is a place will be there and it will close. And so when the new people come in, they, people have these big dreams. And it's all, to me, the Scotch Tape Store. I don't know, uh, the, in the original first season of Saturday Night Live, <laughs> there, was, there was a skit that were all these various little stores in a strip mall. And the one store was the Scotch Tape Store. <laughs> That's all they sold. And at that time, there was only two kinds. There was the shiny and the invisible. And that's all they sold. And all the skit would be them talking about how everyone in the strip mall is suffering. It's really hard. Business is really hard. Right? Well, that's kind of the way things are now. It's like, we're going to do this, and it's going to be different than anybody. It's my dream, and it has to be exactly the way I want it. It has to be fabulous and amazing and fantastic. And so these places that all have high rent anyhow. So, and this is the other thing, is it takes them six months to open the place. So they're paying six months' worth of rent on a business that isn't even open because they come in and put $100,000 or $200,000 in making it so specific because now everything, I don't know what it's like here in San Diego, but everything there is like, you have to have like big screen, flat screens all around the place. Doesn't matter what it is either. <laughs> you know, the lollipop store, flat screens everywhere of people making lollipops. Seriously, there was a cake pop store down the street, a cake pop store in a town where nobody eats or sugar or carbs. There's a cake pop <laughs> store. I. I always think, are they laundering money, all these places? I always think, what are they doing? I never saw anyone in there 
in the year that it was open, meaning I never even saw anyone working there. I never saw anyone in it ever. <laughs> so they have all these stores. And so instead of coming in and saying, well, what's in here that we can use so we don't have to start all over again? Like, well, they have an oven and they have a sink and they have a this place. No, strip it down to the studs. That's what everyone does. Strip it down to the studs. We'll send six months rebuilding it, making it fabulous and amazing. And then it's something that nobody wants, but it's my big dream. <laughs> it's my big dream to open this kind of a store. And you go, that's never going to work. That's the dumbest thing ever. Who the There was a place, this one store that I'm going to tell you about. This guy opened it, and it was the weirdest thing. Instead of just having a juice place, he spent all this money, again, with the flat screens and the amazing paintings and the this and that. And then he built, and then they always hire 200 people <laughs> to work in these places, a place where there's no traffic except at night anyhow, you know, people walking. And he opened, instead of just having a juicing place, it had all of the produce there. So it had, you know, bins of strawberries and this and that and kale and all this stuff. And what you had to do was walk around and pick your own produce and then estimate how much of it would make a shake and take it over to them. And then they would take it and turn it into a shake. And there were like 20 people that worked there in this little place that you would see maybe three people a day in. Okay, so of course that lasted as long as the lease was, and then that place closed. And then they opened something else that they gutted and redid, and then that opens for six months, and then they opened uh, this pizza place. So, and, and they're always like, they're all, they're, it's not just a pizza place, they're always like, it's this fabulous, like, th this is not how anybody ever does pizza. This is like amazing pizza place. So it's been there maybe a year, and it's closing down. What do you think is moving in there now? By the way, gutting the place and starting all over with high end, what do you think is moving in there now? A pizza place. <laughs> okay, the pizza place just failed here. We're putting in another pizza place. Do you know Dame Edna? Dame Edna Everidge, the Barry Humphreys who does drag for like 30 or 40 years or something like that, had a talk show years ago. And the tech talk show was set in what was like a big castle. And the first show, I'll never forget, came out and said, this is an 18th century Spanish monastery, which we tore to the ground and built an exact replica of. <laughs> That's like this pizza place. OK, we tore this pizza place to the ground to build another high end. That's what people think of when they think of dreaming big. It's got to be better, more money, more investment, more different, more unique. Do you know what sells? Ordinary quality. Big is the energy that's brought to it, not how high-end your crap is, right? the paint on the wall. It has to be nice, of course. You want it to be clean. You want it to be serviceable. You want it to be all of those things. But it's the big energy that actually makes something successful. And that, you know, I mean, this goes back even as far as Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill talk. That book, I have to tell you, it's so misguided, the title of it which is really the problem with that book, and it's really the only problem with that book, is that it makes it sound like, just think and grow rich. But if you read the book, it's like, and do this, 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 and do this. Like, there's a lot of shit to do, <laughs> as there should be, right? Participation, right? And part of that is going the extra mile and offering value, more value than somebody else is. Not more pretense, more actual value. That's why I keep talking about know what you're bringing to the table other than just your dream and your show you're putting on, right? That's that idea of little by little, right? The thing is, is not the room that I'm meeting in. It's what's the energy I am bringing. That's what people are going to remember is the energy that you're bringing. Of course, you want to do the best you can. You want to have the nice, comfortable seats and all of that, but you don't go in way over your head. That's what people do. That's why half these people end up bankrupt, right? It's, they're thinking about form and not the big content. It's the big energy that you bring. And I don't mean an excited, frantic energy necessarily. I mean the energy of, I am passionate about this, right? 
I mean, you know, th you just think people don't think these things through. Like the first time I walked in there and was like, how do I know how many of these things will make one shake? I don't know how much stuff to put in here. What am I supposed to do? And they're going to weigh it. And it's just insane. It's like, what the hell are you thinking? I want to just walk up to the counter and tell you what to put in my shake. I could have gone two blocks down to Trader Joe's and bought all this stuff and made it at home myself. Instead, I'm doing it here and handing it to you so that I can pay you to push that button? So you just have to stop and think, what is it that I have to offer? What is, when I'm dreaming big, that's about the energy, not necessarily the form of the thing, right? It's that I am not thinking in an energetically finite and limited way. You know, um, I saw this little thing, I think it was on PBS, where they were doing Somebody, it was somebody at Disneyland, and I don't even remember what, why they were doing it, but they were talking about the progress electronically of things. And so they were saying, one of the things, of course, you know, being so close to Disneyland, is that it, Walt wanted everything to maintain the magical feeling so that you would not see characters out of costume with their head off or something like that walking around like that would be hidden away the machines that made things run were in buildings that you couldn't see or things were underground and all that kind of stuff so that it looked real so that you kept that your the suspension of disbelief going and so they were talking about how it used to be these huge buildings that would run these rides and all this stuff and everything and the, but the guy said now it's this and he had this little thing in his hand that was half the size of your phone he said oh now it's just this it's just this this just runs all this stuff. You just da 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 da. That's how you know we're always basically on the cutting edge of continuing to refine everything. And he said about Walt, which I loved. He said, well, "If you wanted to work with Walt, you could never say no. Because as soon as you said no to him, it was I don't want to work with you. We're done. So you couldn't say no to Walt. So what you people learned was what you said to Walt was yes if." So Walt would say something impossible like, what we need is to levitate donkeys across the yard. <laughs> and so the person would say, and he would say, can we do that? And they would go, yes, if we figure out how to suspend gravity. <laughs> then you were still in the game, right? You were still, the ball is still in play. We don't know how, but the ball is still in play, right? And that's how evolution happens is that this is what I love. This is the thing that Ernest Holmes taught, was that we know what, not how. The law knows how, but not what. You get that? The law doesn't know what. When you put a seed in the ground and nature takes over, it doesn't know if it's growing a watermelon or a rose. It doesn't know. It has no volition in that way. It is just doing what it knows how to do. We decide what gets planted, whether we put it a weed in the ground, or a watermelon in the ground, or a rose in the ground, but we don't know how. Even if we biologically can look and say, well, this is the response, and this is what happens molecularly, but we don't really know why, right? That's not our part. Our part is to keep moving beyond where we've been before. That's what Ernest Holmes kept teaching was, God wants to evolve as you, through you. Keep saying yes. Keep saying yes, keep saying yes, whatever you desire, as long as it does not interfere with the free will of anybody else or hurt anybody else, then that's for you to experience. Does that make sense? All right. So that's the end of the recorded portion of the CD. All right. Did I, 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 did I go over? No, I love when I don't go over. Okay, I'm almost done, really, but I want to make sure that I told you Are we still on YouTube? All right, then I won't swear too much. <laughs> okay, so what I have, too much. What I have declared, now, a year and a half ago, I did something which I called uh, May Mental Makeover Month. 
And so many of us took the whole month of May and did what we called a mental makeover, where we really cleaned up our consciousness. So we're really focused on um, really everything that we were doing that was interfering. Basically, half of it was dissolving limiting beliefs. So it was really about being aware of where you had some limiting belief. Now, part of where that came from was I had a friend who I was having lunch with, and she's a, a screenwriter and writes for TV and stuff like that. And she had not sold anything for like a year or so. And so we were having lunch and she said, and she's someone that gets the tapes and reads the books. She knows all this stuff and really like doing it. And so she said to me, well, I haven't sold anything because I was told that they're not buying scripts now from people like me because ba da 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 And I just looked at her and I said, well, you know that's just a story. Well, she didn't know that was just a story. She didn't know that was just a limiting belief. Because there are lots of things that we take to be facts that are just somebody else's limiting belief that we've taken on. They've told us something and we've said, oh. Right? That's why Ruth Gordon always said, never face the facts. <laughs> and now, she didn't mean don't look at the facts. What she meant was don't bow down to them as the final authority. You face the facts because you want to know what you're dealing with, but then you say, but I have consulted a higher authority. Right? So as soon as, as soon as we had that lunch, I said, well, you know, that's just a story. That's just a limiting belief because somebody else who doesn't believe that, their script is being sold right now because they don't know that people aren't buying scripts like that right now, so they're selling it. So immediately, within a month, she had sold a script, and she was back working again. Just by that change of mind, just that shift of thinking. So then we did this May mental makeover month where we really focused on, and it was individual, whatever, you know, it was part of, a lot of it was looking at things that we believed to be true that were simply limiting beliefs. Others were letting go of sabotaging behaviors. One of the things that I did for that month was I did what I call a food cleanse, where I was just eating like 90% of what I was eating was just salads, fruits and vegetables, and water, just to be mentally clear. Because my, my insulin and stuff was not, there was just very, very clear. So you do whatever you want. But I realized that I had so much success with that, and a lot of people had so much success with that, but what I realized was a month is not enough. <laughs> Therefore, I have declared for those who want it that 2015 is mental makeover year. So you start to look here as you, if you want to download the little booklet and fill it out, that you start to look at, okay, what if I'm going to start to create my year from my own visions and dreams? See, that's why I love the name of this place, vision. What is your vision? So you start to look at what is my vision and how can I begin little by little walking through my fear and resistance in order to achieve my dreams and goals while enjoying every step of the way. That's a big goal and very doable, very, very doable. And you will make mistakes and you will mess up and you will fall down and roll around in the ditch and the mud and the gunk for a minute and then you go, that was a refreshing rest. <laughs> Back onto the highlighted route. Right? There is no feeling sorry for yourself. There's no shame. We have to get over shame. Oh my God. The, this is what Pema Chodron calls, I think it's Pema Chodron who says, the embarrassment of being the self. <laughs> Isn't that horrible and true? The embarrassment of being the self. Always, that's that thing of trying, I'm trying to be so spiritual, I'm not a human anymore. I don't have any of those human problems, right? I'm now, because I'm enlightened now, right? That's why the Course in Miracles says, enlightenment is not a change at all. It's just a recognition of what's always been there. And you recognize it every moment, or you don't. But it doesn't change it. That self that's eternal doesn't change. It's just sometimes you're looking at it and sometimes you're not. But enlightenment is not a static state of being. That thing where people say, well, I want to be where I just am in oneness all the time and I don't feel any separation. And I'm like, well, that's awful. 
That's terrible. If you had no sense of separation, you would have come in here and sat down on someone else's lap. <laughs> I have to have an awareness of where my body ends and yours starts. That's just another one of those bullshit spiritual things that doesn't mean anything, that we think sounds sweet. Oh, no separation. Well, we, our cars would just be crashing into each other all day long. I'm just one. <laughs> like, right? We want to have the discernment of separation and see differences to be able to discern whether, you know, I want to be able, you know that thing, I don't want to have any judgment. No, I want to know, oh, don't pick up the serial killer. <laughs> right? I want to have a little discernment in my mind where I'm able to tell the difference. Right? We would say, do you understand how silly these spiritual things are? It's not that we don't want to have judgment. It's that we don't want to have attack thoughts, right? We don't want to have attack thoughts because they don't leave our own mind anyhow. They're just attacking within. So we want to be able to know that we are separate in bodies. We're separate in our lives, but we're one being. We're one infinite being in that one mind. That's a lot of what that whole think and grow rich thing is based on the idea of a master mind and Ernest Holmes just calls it the one mind the one life but it's the same basic thing that place where we're we're not just connected there's only one right but that's not what we're experiencing now it's like going to Disneyland and talking all about how nice it is at home what'd you come for oh the Matterhorn is great but my bed my, you know, it's just like my bed and the remote control is so nice. It's right where I can find it. And, you know, it's like have the experience. We want to have the experience without being owned by the experience, right? You go to Disneyland and you want to buy into it, but you don't, you know, it's not real, but you don't walk through the place the whole day going, well, none of this is real. It's all fake. It's all phony. That's not really a dog. That's not a mouse. Right? Sometimes I think spiritual people are like that. It's all an illusion. This world isn't real. You know, I love what Ernest Holmes says. This world is as real as it needs to be. It's as real as it needs to be in order to have the experience that we want to have here to evolve and grow and enjoy life. There are people that were blown away when I, I don't know that I'll ever be speaking at the Miracle Distribution Conference again after all the things I've said about the course, but <laughs> that's okay too. Uh, but it was interesting, after the last lecture and the things that were in my last book, there were people who said, I was so, he, they, there was this guy who was blown away. He said, I didn't know it was okay for me to love the world. That it's okay to love the world. We're, we feel like, oh, I just hate it here. Well, the reason anybody hates it here is because we're focusing on all the things we don't like and that we can't do anything about. Right? Usually things, this is what gets me, okay. I don't want to offend anybody, but I will <laughs> offend somebody probably. It's, it's amazing to me the people who complain so much about the state of the world are middle to upper class white people who really don't have a whole shitload of shit to be complaining about. The people a lot of times who are suffering are not complaining nearly as much as the people who are doing well. But you know what it is? Guilt and shame over doing well. Instead of just saying, I'm going to do well and help other people. The thing that I love about prospering and thriving now is that I'm able to feed other people. Right? When I couldn't pay my own rent, I didn't really care about you. <laughs> I have my own problems. Thank you, miss. Right? My needs are covered, so I love feeding people. I love clothing people. I love doing things for other people because I'm not doing it out of a place of guilt and sacrifice. Oh, we should save the world. Right? Save the world. Save yourself. Save yourself. Once you save yourself, then you have something to offer somebody else. That's why... You know, when Dorothy goes back to Kansas 
you know, she's a teacher now. She, you don't go back the same way. That's the hero's journey. You don't go back the same way. All those people, all those characters in Into the Woods that go through hell and back, they are not the same people at the end of that journey. Now they're way showers. Now you're a teacher. Not because you're so wise and you're so much more evolved than other people, but because you can go, yeah, that sucks. It's hard, but I know how to get through. Watch this. That's all. You're not better than anybody else. You're not smarter than anybody else, but you do start to understand there are shortcuts. You know, Terry says something now that's interesting. Uh, I love this because it's so true. She's been here lots of times, I'm sure, saying this, where she says, you don't want to learn through trial and error. It's the worst way to learn because there's an infinite amount of wrong choices you could make. <laughs> Right? Oh, I tried this, I tried this, I tried this, I tried this. That's the value in us being together is we can get together and share and say, you don't have to do that, I did that, that's a dead end. <laughs> oh, you don't have to do that, that's a dead end. This, oh, this is a shortcut. You can go through this way. You don't have to do it the hard way. You can if you want to, it's not bad if you do, but I'm just going to give you the information, do with it what you will. Right? That's the value is that we just that we help each other that way and saying, you know, you don't have to go through years of throwing everything out and bringing it all back a little bit at a time. I'll come in here and tell you the horror of all the mistakes I made, and then you'll go, oh, I'm glad I'm not that Jacob. <laughs> I just went to the talk and decided I was just going to plan and not be attached to it. And now it's all we're all good to go. <laughs> right? All right. Um, is there anything else I'm supposed to say, Joel? No. All right, let's pray. Once again, we close our eyes, take a nice deep breath. <sighs> Relaxing into that infinite oneness of spirit without losing any of our humanity. That we are divine beings in every aspect of our beingness. There's nothing about ourselves that we need to get rid of. We can simply notice when we have a false or stressful or limiting belief and begin to let it dissolve away as we think a new thought, as we choose a new direction as we let go of pushing against what we don't want and instead go in the direction of what we do want, not in order to be happy. We can be happy right now. A flower can be completely happy in its beingness while still reaching for the sun every day. That's how natural our evolution is. So in this awareness of God as us, we open all of our energy centers today. We open our minds to receive guidance and direction in our continued growth and expansion. As these dreams rise up, whether they seem big or small is not relevant what is relevant is our willingness to walk through our fear, our resistance, our will to fail, by instead focusing on the fact that we are not alone. We are part of the great cosmic dance of life expressing through us. If we are willing to grow in our own timing and in our own way, we shall have a life of miracle following miracle.
And in this season of light, and in this time of the winter solstice eve, we are able to spend more time cultivating this inner power, not wishing or hoping that people or situations or things would be different, not looking to be saved or found or produced, but instead beginning to know the gifts that we have, that we are right now. No, right now, you are good enough. You are enough. You deserve to live and thrive no matter what has happened in your past, you can be made new in this holy instant. Are you willing? Do you want to be free? Breathe it in. Know it to be true. We give thanks for this joining together this morning. For everyone who is here, everyone who will hear the recording, everyone who will see it on video, knowing that we are all blessed and blessings, we offer ourselves to this divine presence, our hands, our feet, our voices, asking for guidance, asking for direction, and knowing it is given. We recognize now, as always, the way that we will know this infinite loving power is as it moves through us to the world around us. For this we are thankful, and together we all say, Amen. You might want to stretch a little bit. And make sure there's nothing else to tell you before I release you into the <laughs> wild the wildness of the holidays. Okay, my plan at this point is to come back twice a year. So to come back like now around the holidays and then to come back in the summer because that's really, if I could just teleport myself here, I would come more, but because of the drive twice a year and so I'm working, I'm just starting a new book. So my intention is that by the time I come back in the summer that that book will be uh, finished and available here. I know they have some uh, uh, the books that I published this year out there. I did two books this year that I published that may be out there. Um, have a great holiday. Thank you so much for coming out. Lovely to see you. Thank you.